We're extremely happy to welcome Rabbi Benjamin Spratt, who is known to many of us as a respected and popular speaker at our center. And he's also remembered as a very engaging panelist at our last two interfaith conferences. He was ordained by the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in May 2008, concentrating in Jewish philosophy. In his years at the seminary, the rabbi was the recipient of many awards and prizes in Talmud, philosophy, homiletics, and the Bible. Born in Salt Lake City, Utah, Rabbi Spratt spent his early years exploring his Jewish identity. His journey took him through the conservative, renewal, orthodox, and reconstructionist worlds of Judaism before finding a home within the reform movement. The rabbi graduated magnum cum laude in 2001 from the Honors College of the University of Oregon as a member of Phi Beta Kappa with the BA in Psychology and Religious Studies. He earned distinguished honors for his thesis on early Jewish mysticism. Rabbi Spratt has served as a religious school teacher for 16 years, a religious school director, and a chaplain at Lenox Hill Hospital and Bellevue Hospital here in Manhattan. For the last 12 years, Rabbi Spratt has served as senior associate rabbi of congregation Rodef Shalom, here in New York City, and as the rabbi in residence of Rodef Shalom School. And it was recently announced that as of June 2021, he will be the new senior rabbi at Congregation Rodef Shalom. Many congratulations, Rabbi. Well done. So the subject of his talk today is Light in the Darkness, Illuminating the Meaning of the Winter Solstice through Jewish wisdom. So over to you, Rabbi, thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. And such an honor to be with you again. Swamiji, thank you so much for the honor of getting to learn with you in your community. And want to acknowledge that today is actually the beginning of Kwanzaa. And uh, the very nature of this actually came from, I want to give credit to Diane in, in the email exchanges we were trying to find an appropriate date started to realize that it was going to be somehow in proximity to the winter solstice, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah. And what really prompted this was reflecting the ways in which, at least in the Jewish tradition, the idea of the celebration of Hanukkah is one of the ways that many Jews feel a sense of identity expression in a world where there's so many other religions and so many other holidays of the season. And the idea behind this was actually, uh, tonight we're going to look into kind of the secrets of Hanukkah, the celebration, the Jewish celebration and the Festival of Lights, and look at actually some of the universal threads that certainly for anyone here who's celebrated Diwali, anyone who's celebrated Christmas, anyone who's celebrated Yule or many of the other holidays that we'll mention in just a moment, that we're going to have a chance to kind of explore together these threads that may weave us together uh, because of some more more universal primal human experiences. So I'm going to share my screen. I've also just pasted into the chat a PDF of this if you prefer looking at another point in time. Um, if anyone has trouble opening it, just let me know in the chat and um, I will find another way to get it to you. So I want to begin um, acknowledging that uh, I am not a master of looking at the history of Hinduism or its expression today. But I did, in, when I was in college and studying uh, religious studies, I remember we had a whole seminar where we were focused really on uh, the multiple origin stories of Diwali. And both in Hinduism, also in Jainism and Sikhism, um, millions and millions of people around the world are celebrating Diwali, but having a different origin story behind it. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here because I'm, I'm sure many people who are here in this call could spend hours teaching. I know Swami certainly could here. Uh, but I did want to elevate this idea that within Hinduism, which is even older in many ways than Judaism, the multiple threads that come through this festival of Diwali are also mirrored in many other religious traditions around the world. 
So for a moment, I'm going to be privileging the Northern Hemisphere here. Although if we were to look at the winter solstice uh, and its equivalent in the Southern Hemisphere, we'd find identical parallels really. But I am going to be Northern Hemisphere centric here. So my apologies to anyone that had offense. Um, but I, I wanna elevate a few others. Some of these you've heard of, some of you haven't. So um, Kiomos is actually a Pakistani uh, festival of the winter solstice. Yule, many of us have heard of a Yule log or Yuletide, um, which is often now conflated with Christmas, but it really is a Norse holiday that goes back many, many, many centuries. Um, Christmas, obviously, although what's interesting is that the um, most prominent symbol of Christmas, at least in America, is the Christmas tree, which of course actually is a German pagan um, ritual, and interesting that that has been embraced now. So Cosmoche, this is a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist festival. Kwanzaa, which is really an American, African-American festival. It's much more modern. Midwinterblatt, which is a Swedish festival. Saturnalia, which is a Roman festival. And Zagmuk, which is a Babylonian festival of the winter solstice. And there are many, 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 many more. What's remarkable is that within a, a really a three month period from around November-ish to basically mid January, end of January, almost every religion and culture in the Northern Hemisphere has something that is coming around these darkest days of the year that is focused on light. Every single one of these holidays that are mentioned here, that I've written here, center around the image of light at this time of darkness. And so tonight I'm gonna to go in particularly into, or, or day, depending on where you're tuning in from, but I'm gonna be diving into the particulars of Hanukkah for a moment. Um, for some of us, we may be familiar with Hanukkah already. If not, no, don't worry. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a brief overview here of this eight day festival of lights that Jews around the world have been celebrating for a little over 2000 years now. So here is a very brief summary. I'll make it even briefer that if we're gonna go all the way back to 168 BCE, the Syrian Greeks led by Antiochus um, ended up taking over Jerusalem and desecrated the temple. They decided to turn it over actually to the Greek gods, particularly to Zeus and ended up engaging in pagan sacrifice in the temple. What's important about this is at that point in time, Judaism was centralized around the temple in Jerusalem. The whole theology, the whole belief system believed that God actually lived in that temple and nowhere else. And that if you wanted to communicate with God, it had to be in that temple with priests, with sacrifices. And so with the sacking of the temple and turning it over to pagan gods, it wasn't simply symbolically a defeat. It was actually literally the cutting off of the communication line between the Jewish people and God. And so it, this day became the darkest day of the calendar. And so a Jewish resistance movement rose up and uh, there's a whole lot of politics surrounding this, but um, the priestly family was known as the Hasmoneans. This upstart kind of ragtag group of you know, rebellious fighters, freedom fighters here called the Maccabees ended up doing what seems like the impossible. They were able to temporarily defeat the uh, Syrian Greek army long enough to be able to take back Jerusalem take back the temple and restore it and rededicate it. And Hanukkah literally means dedication. And so it's honoring this rededication of the central hub of Judaism. And so that's really the beginning of what is Hanukkah is it's this military victory. It's kind of a, another version of a David and Goliath story, the underdog vanquishing the mighty army and being able to bring the sacred back into the center of Judaism. What's interesting is the most common story that actually is told in Jewish households around the world is not necessarily so focused on this military victory, but instead this uh, later telling of a miracle. So some of us may have heard the story. Um, uh, the legend has it that when the Maccabees took back the temple and they were rededicating the temple, one of the fixtures of the temple in Jerusalem was a menorah, was a seven branched candelabra that was lit every single day, a, a sign and a symbol of the divine presence that was residing there. And it used special oil that had been purified and dedicated. And as they were going to light this menorah, they found that all of the other, all of the 
oil had actually been smashed and destroyed. And there was only one cruise, one small jar of oil that was left, only enough to last for one day. But one of the great mir miracles is that actually, instead of lasting one day, it ends up lasting eight days. And so this story here, which first appears in the Babylonian Talmud, which is a rabbinic text from the sixth century CE, is this most famous story of Hanukkah that's setting aside the military victory. These rabbis in the Talmud in the sixth century introduced this idea of the miracle of the oil. And this becomes the central symbol of Hanukkah. Jews around the world during Hanukkah light a candelabra. It's meant to give a nod to the menorah in the temple that was a seven branch candelabra, but it's also meant to give a nod to this miracle of eight days. And so it actually is an each branch candelabra with a ninth branch to hold a shamash, a helper candle that is used to light the other eight. And so still to this day, Jews around the world light this Hanukkiah, uh, which is just another version of this candelabra. And the idea behind it is to give a nod to this miracle. So what most Jews around the world aren't aware of is that this is the first mention of that story. So written about eight centuries after the events of Hanukkah actually took place. So this text from the fifth, sixth century CE is the first mention of the story of the miracle of the oil Many scholars have tried to imagine what was the motivation of doing this, of introducing the miracle. And one is to bring the touch of God into it, because again, a military victory story doesn't quite bring the sense of God's presence necessarily. And this certainly brings the sense of the miraculous, the majestic, the sacred into the centerpiece of this and does it in a way that makes it accessible to people, um, even in a post-temple time. But again, what's uh, not known to many is that this is actually one of dozens and dozens of origin stories behind Hanukkah. And I'm gonna share a handful of them with you in the hopes that it's then going to take this, what seems like a very simple holiday, make it incredibly complex. And then I hope help bring us out at the end of this conversation tonight with a few nuggets of wisdom that may end up being helpful for all of us in our own respective paths. So this one from the ninth century asked the question, why do we light lights on Hanukkah? Ah, it's because when the Hasmonean high priest, when the Maccabees, when the Hasmoneans took back the temple, upon entering the temple, they actually found eight iron spears. And so they took up those eight iron spears and reforged them into a candelabra to light up the temple. So this story, origin story, morphs this a little bit, imagining that they took weapons of war and destruction and turned them into a symbol of light and hope. And this becomes the basis of Hanukkah. But we can go back even earlier, first century CE, the Jewish historian Josephus, who's writing around the time of Jesus, he offers something very interesting. So something that feels a little bit familiar here, so this idea that Judah, uh, one of the Maccabees, ends up celebrating this festival for eight days when the temple was restored, sacrifices were brought into the temple, and lots of wonderful singing and psalms that were offered. But what was so interesting here is he tries to grapple with why the symbol of light. And so you get to see towards the end of this passage here, they were so very glad at the revival of their customs when after a long time of intermission, they unexpectedly had regained the freedom of their worship, that they made it a law for their posterity that they should keep a festival on account of the restoration of the temple worship for eight days. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it lights. I suppose the reason was because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us and that from there was the name given to that festival. So the piece that I wanted to hone in here is Josephus, writing in the first century CE, so again, writing about 300 or so years uh, after, uh, I guess, more about 200 years after the events of Hanukkah actually take place, he's not calling it Hanukkah, he's not calling it dedication, he's calling it lights. Already at that point, the central focus was about bringing light into the world, and he's guessing a little bit as to what that's intended to mean, 
but wanted to lift up that idea that at least at that point, at a far more proximate time, it was not called Hanukkah, like the rabbis called it in the sixth century, but rather lights. So to then make it even more complex here, we actually have two books that were written around the time of the events of the Maccabees. These are the books of Maccabees. They don't make it into the Hebrew Bible. They're what are called Apocrypha. So these are biblical books written around the time of the Bible, but didn't make it into the actual canon, into the Jewish canon. And so they're bundled together and they're called Apocrypha. And many of the early rabbis from 2000 years ago were reading them and studying them, but they're not actually a part of the existent Jewish canon. Nonetheless, we have access to them. And these are the earliest texts we have that mention the events actually of Hanukkah. And I wanted to bring them forward because we're gonna see even a different origin story here. So the first book of Maccabees offers this quote. And they, the Maccabees, arose on the 25th day of the ninth month. Okay, that is still to this day, the 25th day of Kislev is the day that Jews celebrate Hanukkah. In the 48th year and offered sacrifice according to the law upon the altar of burnt offering, which they had made. At the time and on the day the heathens had polluted it, it was rededicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. So uh, putting this in here for this particular reason, why Hanukkah and why at this time of year? It's because according to this text, when the Maccabees took back the temple, they looked at that day of destruction, the 25th day of Kislev that the prior year had been turned over to worship of the god Zeus, and that it had been seen at that point as the destruction of the center of Judaism. And they decided they wanted to invert it from a day of darkness into a day of light. And so they deliberately take that same day, the anniversary of the sacking of the temple, to be the day that they dedicate the temple. So inverting destruction into creation, inverting what they see as the profaning of something into the sacralizing of it. But to go even further, many modern scholars then ask the question, well, why would the Assyrian Greeks dedicate the temple to Zeus on the 25th day of Kislev? And so Louis Finkelstein, one of the great scholars um, from the past century, he actually offers this thought, that maybe it was just a mere coincidence, but what he puts forward is that there actually was a recognition that at that time of year, always the winter solstice, the Assyrian Greeks would offer sacrifices and a great festival to light up the world and to bring joy and festivity into the darkest, the coldest days of the year. And so one of the thoughts that he brings forward is that Antiochus actually intentionally took over the temple and rededicated it on that day because it was the winter solstice, because it was already a Greek festival. And so what were they going to do naturally as the Assyrian Greeks, when they find themselves in a sacred place, they would go in, take that sacred place and turn it into something that allowed them to bring their own sense of the sacred forward. And what's interesting about this is we get to see the layering of a pagan festival, a Greek pagan festival, that ends up becoming the very reason and the cause for a Jewish celebration. To make things even more interesting is that perhaps Jews were already celebrating that pagan festival. And so that it became very natural to simply now refocus that festival onto the rededication of the temple. And so this idea may be that the first origin story of Hanukkah is that it actually had nothing to do with Judaism. It was simply a time of year that people were already observing and celebrating and lifting up light. And in the rededication of the temple, it was a way of channeling that energy and taking the collective sense and the collective desire for hope and light in the world and putting into a Jewish context. But again, let's make things even more confusing here. So the book of second Maccabees, written around the same time as the first book, offers a very different theory. So at the time that the Maccabees were engaged in guerrilla warfare, fighting the Assyrian Greeks, they were having to live in the mountains, live in caves. And when it came time, for the festival of Sukkot. This is a harvest festival that happens usually in October. So a little bit before Diwali. So this is the prime harvest time. Diwali usually marks the very final moment of harvest. 
So Sukkot was in those days, a time where you would build booths still to this day, you'll see many Jews around the world that will put up temporary huts and structures, and would lift up plants would wave four different species of plants to symbolize fertility and wanting to spread fertility and blessing around the world. Unfortunately, at that time, they were living in caves, and they weren't able to go and build huts, and they weren't able to gather these species of plants. And what's remarkable is that in those days, Sukkot, this festival of booths, was actually the holiday. In the Bible, it's called Hechag, the holiday. So nowadays, most Jews would say that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Jewish New Year and the Day of Atonement are the high holidays, the most important days. Back then it was Sukkot, this holiday of gratitude and bounty. And so they weren't able to celebrate their festival of Sukkot, but the moment they take back the temple, what's the first thing they wanna do? They wanna celebrate the holiday that they missed. And so how long is Sukkot? Sukkot is seven days long, plus an eighth day of celebration called Shemini Atzeret. And so the second book of Maccabees imagines that the Maccabees take back the temple and they've gathered these plants together, beautiful branches and palm leaves too, and they're singing hymns of praise, which we do on Sukkot. So what is Hanukkah? One of the oldest books suggests that it's simply a delayed celebration of another holiday that already is happening. And what's remarkable is that now today, if you look at Jewish communities around the world, many Jewish communities around the world still to this day, not knowing this early connection, continue to connect the festival of Sukkot with the holiday of Hanukkah. So still to this day, some people will take up as an ornament in their sukkah, in their booth, they'll actually have a flask of olive oil that they then will use for lighting their Hanukkah lights. And some others will actually take actually some of the plants that are used on Sukkot and will dry them out and use them as wicks for the lighting of the candles on Hanukkah. And again, interesting to see that even 2000 years later, unknowingly still today, Jews have this connection between Sukkot and Hanukkah, even though most have no awareness of this earlier connection. So I wanna bring forward Another interesting perspective. So if anyone's ever uh, had the chance to hang out with Jews on Hanukkah, there's a game that's often played, which is called dreidel. It's a little top that has four sides and there's a different Hebrew letter on each side. And depending on, you spin the top and depending on where the dreidel lands, it tells you whether you win or lose. And it's a gambling game. You put in some money and you spin the dreidel. And if it lands on hay, you get, let's say one of the Hebrew letters, you get half the pot. If it lands on nun, you get nothing. If it lands on shin, you end up having to put some of your own money in. And if it lands on gimel, yahtzee, you win and you get everything. And it's a gambling game. And for many Jews around the world, if you were to ask them, why do we play dreidel? They'll tell you this legend that in the times of the Maccabees, the times the Syrian Greeks took over the temple, they banned Jews from observing Jewish holidays and studying Jewish texts. And so what would the Jews do? They would huddle together and they would study secretly and pray secretly. And if any of these Syrian Greeks came by, they would spin these tops as a way of saying, oh, we're just playing a game. What's fascinating is that's not actually the origin story of Dreidel at all. Dreidel actually was a popular gambling game uh, across Europe about 400 years ago. And what was interesting is if you go and look at in Germany, in France, in Italy, all around Western Europe, this was a game that was basically the equivalent of playing poker today. In Judaism, gambling is forbidden and it's uh, prohibited in the Bible for it. And it's interesting that still to this day, Jews will engage in this gambling game. Now, it's usually done now symbolically with, with uh, chocolate guilt, so with chocolate money. So not usually literally gambling actual money. But nonetheless, the reason why we have this dreidel game is because Jews at that time were looking at ways of being able to make Hanukkah feel more exciting. And so they created a religious spin, pun intended, on this spinning top game basically taking the most interesting game of what was around and using it to create some new sparks, some new spice 
actually in Judaism. So get a wonderful question here. Was it a way by God to unite both cultures, meaning Greek and Jews? Greek already celebrated a day and Jews defeated them and had a jar left, which lasts for eight days. The twist is it possible 100%. So one of the things that I, I do think is really interesting um, about that idea that is this a way that maybe we could look at God's hand um, in helping to link cultures or religions together. I actually think it's a really important point. And when we get to the end of the talk, I think that's gonna be a through line that you'll get to see here. I think it's a really important aspect of noticing that and really, truly, every one of the Northern Hemisphere cultures and religions, there is something at these darkest days of the year that lifts up light. So want to um, now move forward just a little bit here. So nowadays, at least in the United States of America, Hanukkah is actually something that is marked not only with the lighting of lights, but actually also with the giving of gifts. Um, and some may have heard the custom that, you know, uh, Jews will give each other presents um, each of the eight nights of Hanukkah. Uh, this is a very recent addition to the observance of Hanukkah, and I wanted to give you the origin story of that practice. So Mordecai Kaplan, who was the founder of the Reconstructionist Movement of Judaism, I would argue probably the most impactful um, rabbi of the 20th century, he ends up making this very interesting point. He's talking about Judaism, but really could apply to any religion. He says, the history of the Jewish religion points to the truth that the religion which invests with universal import, the sancta, that is the sacred elements of the civilization in which it functions, has most survival value. A religion does so when it enables these sancta, these sacred elements to elicit loyalty, not merely to one's people, but also loyalty to what is regarded as the deepest and holiest of human interests. Said differently, in my own language here, what Kaplan is making the point is that what allows for a religion or civilization, a culture to persist, is the degree to which can take a universal need and bring it forward in a meaningful particular way. And so what he's doing is he's trying to look at Judaism and boil it down to these surface layers that make it look and feel different, whether it be dietary habits or the Jewish Sabbath or prayer or different texts, if we were to look beneath them, are they actually speaking to a universal human need or are they simply just a way of creating difference and distinction? And his argument is that if it wasn't connected to a universal human need, it would fall away. And so what a religion or a culture could do to ensure its own survival is to always actively look at the best of what's around, the universal needs of what's around, and find a way to bring it in a particular way back in. And so writing in 1934 in a book called Judaism as a Civilization, he is looking up and seeing that since Hanukkah falls so near the Christmas season, it must be made as interesting and joyful for the Jewish child as Christmas is made for the Christian child. The Hanukkah festival should be the season for gifts. The children should look forward to gifts from their parents and parents from their children. Receiving and giving gifts contributes to the festal air of the home. It should be the season for paying social calls, paying home games, and playing home games and holding communal entertainments. Purim gifts, which is a Purim is a later holiday, usually in uh, February or March, which is customarily a time for gifts, though prescribed by custom will naturally grow rare as Hanukkah gifts will become more and more in devote. And sure enough, here we are less than a century later, and all around America, you're going to see that Jews almost universally give gifts at Hanukkah. And where did we get it from? It's because Mordecai Kaplan was looking around and saying, wow, look at how much joy is coming from Christian homes, look at all the kids, they're so excited here. There's universal need at the time of darkness to bring forward some joy and some uplift. What a great idea, we should do that too. And so what he's just doing is naming and making explicit what was perhaps there all along. So one of the threads that I find most interesting about Hanukkah is that in its origin story, about it being the story of Jews opposing a larger majority culture, it's often brought up also as a way of suggesting Jews being able to stay in their particular identity and stave off assimilating into that majority culture. 
as we look at the actual details of Hanukkah and the many origin stories of Hanukkah, we start to see a slightly different story emerge here, is we actually get to see that the very thing that allowed Hanukkah to persist, the very thing that actually allowed Judaism to persist, was the exact opposite, was actually taking the ideas and practices of what was around and bringing it into Judaism. The most observed ritual in Judaism around the world today is a Passover Seder. This is a festival meal that's done in the springtime that recounts the story of the Exodus, the slavery of the Israelites in Egypt, their found redemption, and this, this uh, scripted meal that allows people to gather together in a banquet and discussions are had on particular symbols. The symbols of the food are used to elicit conversation and reflect on the story of redemption and how that speaks to us today. And across the world today, this is the most observed Jewish practice in the world. What most Jews don't realize is that the Passover Seder was not originally Jewish. 2000 years ago, we get to find that the early rabbis were looking at a Jewish world that had had its heart destroyed. So the temple was eventually taken back and ended up destroying, being destroyed by the Romans in the 70 CE. And the rabbis were looking at a Passover that could no, could no longer be centered around the temple. And so what did they do? They looked around and noticed that in that day and age, the most exciting experience was the Greco-Roman symposium. It was a great banquet. It was a dinner party that only the elite, only the creme de la creme of society were able to attend. And what would happen? You would get invited in and you would be brought forward to your own chaise lounge chair and you would recline there in the lap of luxury. And people would bring out waves of food and you would take that food and almost in a salon style way, you would wax philosophical on that food how that food became a symbol of some experience in life or the larger elements or events of the world. And you would know actually when you were coming toward the end of the meal, when you would be given dessert, which in Greek is the word afikoma. Still to this day in a Passover Seder, the dessert, which is not quite as so tasty in a Passover Seder, it's a little bit of um, almost like a cracker, matzah, dried out uh, unleavened bread, it is still called afikomen. It is still called Greek dessert. And we still lounge. We're supposed to recline during a Passover Seder. And we're supposed to lift up foods and ask questions and engage in philosophical conversation on them. What most Jews around the world don't recognize is that the most observed ritual we have is also something that we took from a majority culture. As we go back to Hanukkah, and a story that's often told as a way of showing that we stave off assimilating into a larger culture, the real true story of Hanukkah in many ways is that we were deeply influenced by the way in which the world around us moved and the way in which new symbols and ideas came forward and we found ways of bringing that into the heart of Judaism. So one of the things that we're gonna to get to right now is just a brief summary with all these different threads here. So this is from Michael Zimmerman from about 19 years ago. Um, he ended up giving this, I, I think, very nice succinct idea of just the many threads of Hanukkah. So the focus of Hanukkah has evolved. Originally a celebration of military victory based on faith, rabbis of the Talmud proceeded to emphasize the miracle of the temple rededication. In the Middle Ages, the idea of martyrdom came to the fore, an issue for Jews then persecuted, and for Christians recalling their own ancestors' maltreatment by Romans. The last century's modern Zionism has emphasized military prowess and consciously recalls the initiative, daring, and courage of the ancient Maccabee heroes. In America, Hanukkah and its timing near Christmas is used to revitalize Judaism and symbolize the American ideal of religious freedom and pluralism. So this right here is uh, that I'm about to share is a passage from Gerson Cohen. Uh, he was a former chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary where I studied. This was an address that he gave to um, a set of graduates. And still to this day, it's one of these pieces that I think is truly brilliant and may apply a bit of wisdom that could be used in pretty much every culture and religion around the world. So he makes this point that often when we speak about assimilation, we speak about it in a negative term. 
that what we mean is for a minority identity to be nested within majority identity, we think of assimilation as that minority identity diffusing out and being lost in the majority. But the point that he makes is that assimilation is also a two-way street. That yes, there is the potential that the minority culture, the minority religion will lose itself in the majority. But it also has the opportunity to glean wisdom, to glean new insight, to glean new ideas from that majority culture and to bring it in. And the point that he makes is that if we were to tell the story of Jewish history as the story of a small minority people always fighting off the oppressor, we would miss that the golden ages of Judaism have always been when the barriers between Judaism and the larger culture were lowest, when there was the most possibility of a two-way free flow of information and ideas. And as I've had a chance to sit with a number of historians who have looked at this idea in many other cultures, this continues to come up again and again and again. And still today, we know this, that the greatest ideas come when we take two different disciplines that were formerly siloed and find ways of sharing those ideas and cross-pollinating biology and chemistry, economics and political science. In the context of religion as well, Gerson Cohen makes the point, if Jews believe that the survival of Judaism is only dependent on creating a wall to separate us out from the majority culture, Judaism will likely fade into the dustbins of history. But if we look at how can we see a minority identity nested, a minority identity nested within a larger majority identity? Could there be ways that new sparks of insight could be brought into the heart of Judaism and revitalizing it again and again and again? And so with that idea, want to come to a story that comes actually from the, the Talmud. So again, a collection of rabbinic work from the fifth, sixth century CE. And this is a different imagination of the story of Hanukkah, a much older one that I wanted to bring forward for all of us here. So I'm gonna read it, actually, uh, I'm gonna go word for word here and then I'll uh, make sure to explicate a little bit here, okay? So this is an imagination the rabbis have of going back to the Garden Eden, the Garden of Eden. So the mythic first uh, coupling of humanity in this garden. And our sages taught, when Adam, on the day of his creation, saw the sun sinking in the sky before him, he said, Woe is me! Because I acted offensively, the world is darkening for me and is about to return to darkness and desolation. Indeed, this is the death that heaven has decreed for me. So he sat down to fast and to weep throughout the night, while Eve wept beside him. But when the dawns began slowly rising like a column, he said, Such is the way of nature, and I did not know it, and then proceeded to offer up a bull, a sacrifice. When Adam saw, as the days went on, that the day gradually was diminishing in length, he said, woe is me. Perhaps because I acted offensively, the world around me is growing darker and darker every day and is about to return to chaos and confusion, and this is the death heaven decreed for me. He then sat eight days in fast and prayer. But when the winter solstice arrived and he saw the day is getting gradually longer, he said, such is the way of the world and proceeded to observe eight days of festivity. The following year, he observed both the eight days preceding and the eight days following the solstice as days of festivity. So these early rabbis imagine that the story of Hanukkah may, be, may have nothing to do with the Maccabees taking over the temple or with the rededication of the temple or may have nothing to do with finding eight iron spears and creating a candelabra of light, that maybe it's the very first human being on the planet that was noticing the way the world worked and was simply living enough to notice that with each day the sun would set and then in his fear would come to realize that the sun would rise again, that his day turned into week, turned into month, that the days would get shorter and shorter. And by having the courage to keep his eyes open and to thread his experience from one day to the next, he was able to see that this is the natural cycle of the world, that the days get shorter, but then the days will get longer again. And so what is the origin of the eight-day festival of celebration of Hanukkah? For these early rabbis, they imagine it's this universal human ability to see the natural rhythms of the world and to bring light into those darkest of days 
knowing that these are the rhythms that God has put into motion in the world. And what I love about this origin story is it's almost this playful way that these rabbis writing at a time when maybe they could have or should have focused on having one clear core story, making sure that everyone is telling the same story of Hanukkah, they decide to playfully do the different, something different. They decide, what if we had many stories? What if we had many ways in? What if we thought about this as being something particular to the Jewish people, but maybe also it's something that has nothing to do with Judaism. And it's simply just this human experience of living in the world. What if it has nothing to do with military victory and maybe it has to do with the miracle of a little bit of oil lasting a bit longer than it was supposed to? Or what if it was simply celebrating the way the world actually works, that there wasn't anything supernaturally miraculous, simply the everyday miracle of a world in motion. So with that concept, another brief story. So this comes from a different section of the Talmud, a different section of rabbinic reflection. And there is this passage from the Bible where Rabbi Yossi lifts, lifts up this question. I was long perplexed by this verse, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness. And the question he wonders is, so what difference does it make to a blind man, whether it's dark or light? Once I was walking on a pitch black night, when I saw a blind, blind man walking with a torch in his hand, I asked him, why do you carry a torch? He replied, as long as the torch is in my hand, people can see me and walk beside me. At a time when so many of us want to have the answers to so many things, what I find delightful about Hanukkah and probably delightful about most every winter holiday around the world is that when we start to dig, we start to see that rather than getting clearer with these festivals of light, we end up seeing much more murkiness, much more confusion, much more shadow. But what I love is this universal response of saying, nonetheless, we kindle light in the darkness. So, for some of us, and I include myself in this, this is a year that I think has unsettled many of our elements of certainty. Many of the things that we thought we knew about how the world worked or what we thought could ensure our own health and survival, many of them have proven to be far more uncertain than we ever imagined. And so we may feel at times like we are a blind person groping around, not knowing whether it is day or night. And this interesting bit of wisdom here is maybe that's all the more reason why we should be raising up a torch of light. Not necessarily because it's gonna open up our eyes, but because maybe it will help others come to be closer to us. Maybe it'll help ensure that if we're stumbling around in confusion or worry or fear, that we're not left alone in this world. And so one more idea that I wanted to, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, that I want to bring forward before we have a chance to get to some questions and just some more dialogue here, is when we're looking at these festivals around the world, maybe one of the elements that we get to hold is how we take two different elements of truth, that we can see that each of these religions and cultures has found a way of taking their own life world, their own story, their own ethos, and bring it forward in a particular way and yet, what if, like that story of Adam, we were at the same time able to pull back and look at this deeper universal human need? When the world darkens, we need to create light. When things feel uncertain and we wonder if the world is going to return to a place of bounty and prosperity, we be the ones to create that sense of bounty and that sense of joy. And what would it be if when we think about from Diwali and, and usually end of October and November, when we thread through into Yule celebrations and Christmas celebrations, and we were thinking about Kwanzaa and we go forward and we imagine what it is at this time to look at different homes around the world and each and every home lighting up their light in their own individual way, but see something universal that burns beneath that particular light, something that calls out to us. Because in the words of Mordecai Kaplan, that is when we know that we have actually touched the sacred. When there is something in our particular observances that goes to the heart of the human psyche, wherever you are and whatever culture or religion you come from, 
that you feel this calling in and this drawing to. So as we look backwards on Diwali, as we look backwards on Hanukkah this year, as we look backwards on Christmas, and for those who may be observing Kwanzaa right now, we look at the things that may link us together, even as, at least for me in America, this is a time period where we shine our particularistic lights brightly. And whether they be blue and white lights or they be red and green lights, whatever it may be, could we look beneath the hue of the light and see that universal shine that goes beneath? So I hope that was some new insights, I hope some new ideas. And I know um, at this time we'll get to have some Q&A, some questions back and forth. Anything that you may want to know more of, I may not have the answer, um, and if no one has questions, I certainly have questions for you all, if you want. So anyone that has questions, please raise your hands or, or you can just type it in the chat. So Bill just asked a question, does Hanukkah touch upon the Shema? Excellent question. So the Shema is a, uh, is a single line that comes from the Bible. The line is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear or listen or pay attention, O Israel. Adonai is our God and Adonai is one. Um, it's taking two different names of God. So a particular name of God, this is the Tetragrammaton, yud heh vav -He, which in Judaism we say is unpronounceable. We don't know how to pronounce it. And then Eloheinu, which is a more generic name for God. And we're saying that these are one and the same thing. It's often seen as a declaration of monotheism, of believing in one God. Probably in its origin, it was a way of saying actually that in the many different names for divinity that's out there, we're proclaiming that they are all pointing to the same thing. So what's interesting, Bill, in you lifting up what is there a connection between Hanukkah and Shema is I would say the way that Jews often talk about Hanukkah is a way of saying we're celebrating our own particular God, the God of Israel, the God of the Jewish people, and we're not talking about Zeus. But again, as we had a chance to explore a little bit tonight, it very well may be, and many scholars do believe this, that the festival of Hanukkah originally was a pagan festival probably to Greek gods. And so is this maybe an opportunity to think of the Shema being connected to Hanukkah, perhaps? Is, are we able to, through this particularistic holiday, able to see that universal idea that whether we may call it, you know, Zeus or Krishna or God, Adonai, that could we be able to see that we may be pointing and naming very much the same thing? Do the festivals of light point to imminence? Ah, that there is a spiritual reality that that is here. I want, Swamiji, this is a, a tremendous, I love this. And what a, what a wonderful element. I don't know if you want to bring forward some of your own words on this, Swami, um, but I, I think the, um, the idea that you bring forward, I think, is this human response that um, for most of us, we find fear in the darkness. For most of us, um, we find ourselves stumbling. You know, the, this image that I actually have shared before, um, you know, the uh, Maimonides, Rambam, uh, one of the great medieval scholars, he, um, he offers this image that each of us are climbing a mountain in the darkness. And at a moment in our climb, and we're, we're stumbling and we're tripping and we lose our sense of direction, but at a moment in our climb, there's a lightning flash. And all of a sudden, the, the mountainside is lit up and we can see and get our bearings and we see we're not the only one climbing the mountain. We're not alone. But then the lightning flash is gone. And we're left, left trying to hold on to that image, not knowing if and when there'll be another lightning flash. And I think what you just surfaced, Swami, is exactly, I think, this human need that, especially at this time, especially when it's dark, we need to be reminded that there's a reason to keep our eyes open. We need that sense of imminence, as you said. We need to know that we're not alone. We need to know that there are other people that we can gather together. And that sense that God, that divinity is close to us. I, I think you just named that exactly right. There's a question from Prabir. Please. Uh, Pranam, uh, Mr. Mr. Spratt, am I correct? Yes. So uh, uh, my question is, is it possible for you to, in very, very short, I know this is, a, this is probably an impossible task, to just give me an idea about the Jewish, basic Jewish philosophy. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason I'm asking is, uh, my son just got, got married to a Jewish uh, 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 girl. And uh, we are very happy, 
but I, I want to know a little bit about Judaism and if there's probably a, a basic elementary book that I can buy or get and understand. So if you can help me with, uh, with this. Of course, I, I will do my best. And if you're <laughs> up for it, I'm happy to correspond with you. Um, if you ever want to talk, I'm happy to have a long sure, conversation. I, I would like to definitely correspond with you, Seb. Okay, wonderful. So just um, very briefly, um, because Judaism has been around for almost 4,000 years, similar to the way in which I imagine it would be very, if I if I turned to the Swami here and said, can you summarize all of Hinduism in uh, in a sentence here? So I know the, this is impossible, probably. No, no, no. It's, 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 it, it's the, it has existed in so many different times and cultures. There's so many different layers to it. So without knowing your daughter-in-law's particular Jewish thread, I'll tell you a few things that are often found within kind of a Jewish mentality. So in Judaism, we tend to believe in the need for multiple perspectives, um, that many of our sacred texts have the need for argument and always ambiguity. And so very, very rarely in Judaism is there a clear answer on almost anything. Um, you'll be able to get opinions. You may have heard this before, two Jews, 10 opinions. Um, what comes with this is a, a cultural element of debate and discussion. It can sometimes be very frustrating. Um, some of my friends who are Catholic priests, they could a Catholic from anywhere in the world could sit with them and say, what are your primary tenets of faith? And the Catholic priest could be able to say to anyone around the world, here are the primary tenets of faith. Good luck doing that in Judaism. And so we tend to be focused much more in Judaism on deed, on action, over creed, um, faith. And so there's a lot more uh, sense that what we're doing in practice is what the real focus needs to be. And if you believe in God or don't believe in God, doesn't matter. You pray, you don't pray, eh, not so important. But are you giving to charity? But are you respecting your parents? But are you engaged in actions? So in Judaism, if you were to say, I really believe in God, but you are a despicable human being, nobody is going to pay much attention to you. Um, one other element I, I would say that's helpful in thinking about Judaism is, again, this idea that because it has existed in so many different times and cultures, it is deeply multifaceted. And so the difference, people will think about Orthodox Judaism, but there are thousands of different Judaisms within Orthodoxy. People will think of Reformed Judaism, Conservative Judaism, all these different strands, and each of them are asking, uh, are giving a different answer to the same question, which really is where does truth come from? So again, we could go to much deeper conversation if you want, but those are some of the major arcs that I think probably would be of some help. Is there a, a, a reading list or is there something that? Sure. That, so I'm going to, I'll write my, beginner? I'll write my email address in here. And if you want okay. to um, be in touch, then I'm happy to give you some, some books that we can read and things. So I'll, I'll write it right in here. One one general question: Does is Judaism believe in monotheism just like the Advaita Vedanta? Yes. Great so question. Just... So, in general, yes, um, but again, it it gets a little more complicated than that. Um, most people, if you're reading the Torah, if you're reading the five books of Moses, the the central text in Judaism it probably is not actually a monotheistic document. It probably is a henotheistic document. So it probably believes that there were many gods, but that the God of Israel was maybe the head of them all or in charge of them all. Um, but certainly in later strands of Judaism, this idea of monotheism comes forward, but still this idea of God being expressed in many different ways. And again, I know this parallelism is found in Hinduism and many other religions around the world. You know, if you get into the Kabbalah, for example, God is expressed in 10 different emanations. So the same light, so think of, again, a light bulb and putting a different color lampshade on it. So God may take the form of a, a more of a, a female presence, more of an imminent presence, more of a transcendent presence, but it's all coming from the same light. So in, in summary, yes, Judaism is a monotheistic religion, but that monotheism may manifest itself in a multitude of different ways. Thank you. Of course. Okay, please elaborate on Seder, uh, where there is concentration on food. Is the food considered an offering? And what is the significance of bread and wine traditionally? Amazing question. So, um, so, the, so the, the original celebration of Passover centered around the Paschal lamb. 
So in the events of the Exodus, um, one of the one of the ways that the Israelites were freed from Egypt was uh, Pharaoh having to suffer through plagues, um, through these diseases and blights that would come to the land to try to convince Pharaoh that it was terrible to keep the Israelites enslaved and Pharaoh needed to let them go. And the last of them was actually the angel of death that would visit every home and, and, and kill the babies of the home. And the way that one would be protected from that is one would actually take lamb's blood and paint it on the doorposts of their house. And that ultimately, the horror and destruction that comes from that is ultimately what convinces Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. It's a very, very gruesome, gruesome story. But that idea of the Paschal lamb, the lamb that allowed for the protection from the angel of death, and then the redemption of the Israelites ends up becoming the future symbol of Passover. And what would happen is in the times of the temple, people would bring a sacrifice, would bring a lamb to be sacrificed in the temple, and would bring that lamb back that, and eat that as their festival meal. Once the temple was destroyed, what was interesting is no longer could there be that paschal sacrifice. There were no sacrifices after that. But the rabbis envisioned that the dinner table becomes almost a mini altar. And so, yes, the food is really considered in many ways a symbolic sacrifice. And actually, one of the symbols on the Seder plate is actually a shank bone. It's supposed to be a bone that uh, is giving a nod to that paschal sacrifice from long ago. And the, and the significance of bread and wine traditionally, obviously in Christianity, that ends up becoming a symbol of the, the blood and the body of Christ. But in Judaism, um, even before that, uh, bread and wine were the very definitions of, of a meal, were the very definitions of when you have actually partaken of blessing and bounty in the world. And bread and wine in particular have potency in Judaism because they're two of the only foods that have their own special blessing that require human agency in order to partake of them. So wine doesn't just occur. It takes um, you know, the divine gift of grapes and human agency and time, energy, and effort to create it. Same thing with bread. And both of these are given their own particular blessings that are not really applied to any other food or substance on the planet. There's a blessing for everything in Judaism and many of the blessings for food are kind of generic blessings. But these two, which is kind of this marriage of both divine work and human work, are seen as sacred. And uh, still to this day, these are the two blessings that have the most potency. Um, if you say a blessing over bread, and then you eat anything else, you don't have to say a blessing over any of the other food. That one blessing counts for any other kind of food that you might have. And for wine, very similarly. Okay, and Swami here, we hear of the importance of the text in Judaism, when you speak to the importance of scriptural study in Judaism. Thank you so much, Swami, yes. So the most sacred thing that we have in Judaism is not actually an object, but our words. Um, and this largely stems from the creation story in Judaism, is God creates through speaking. Um, if you ever, I, I mentioned this, I think, actually before at uh, Vedanta, um, so if you've heard of the um, magical term abracadabra, it actually comes from the Hebrew, the Aramaic, abracadabra. So I will create as I speak, which is a nod to the very beginning of Genesis, the beginning of the Torah, where God creates by speaking. And from that, in many ways, um, comes this tradition that uh, words, that language are sacred. And especially when Judaism was forced to become a decentralized religion, when the temple was destroyed and no longer was it Judaism focused on the temple in Jerusalem, there needed to be a new way to interact and have a conduit connection with God. And so that became through largely language. And so text in Judaism is actually seen as a doorway to revelation, a doorway to finding truth. So we study the Torah, the sacred origin text of Judaism, but we add new layers to it. And every generation makes it something new. We call it our Eitz Chaim, our tree of life, that it is ever living and ever changing. And every generation brings new understandings. Um, one of the rabbinic understandings is that there's 70 faces to the Torah. So you take an idea and then you turn it and turn it and turn it. And there's always more. So that becomes this idea that um, every every Jewish holiday, um, every Jewish Sabbath centers around the Torah, centers around a chance to bring forward the reading of scripture, but not just to read it, but to study it and debate it and discuss it. 
So there's not a singular understanding, but a continual unfolding of truth. So revelation isn't just something that happened a long time ago, but it's something that can happen right here and right now. Okay, great questions here. Um, so have Hanukkah celebrations traditions changed over the years since now it's celebrated across many parts of the world? Yes, absolutely. And this is some of what I was um, trying to bring forward that um, when we look at some of the great practices, so um, on, at Hanukkah, many Jews around the world will eat what are called latkes, these potato pancakes. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever had one before. They're delicious. I highly recommend it. Um, and these potato pancakes actually are not Jewish in origin, okay? This was a actually a wet, uh, Eastern European dish that was simply what was around the origin story of the latke. Actually, it was a, a dairy pancake actually from Italy, and it was a very popular dish in, I believe, the 12th century in Italy, and that actually was more of the connection to Hanukkah. Another one of the apocryphal books, the Book of Judith, um, makes mention of the fact that uh, Judith ends up helping to vanquish an Assyrian general by plying him with wine and um, uh, with salted cheese. And so the origin story actually of special foods on Hanukkah had to do with dairy. And it was a just a function of a popular dish in Eastern Europe were these delicious fried potato pancakes. And same thing with the dreidel, that, that game, that top that I told you. And again, likely the candelabra of lighting lights in the windows. On Hanukkah, what's interesting in Judaism is that you're required to light these lights every night of Hanukkah, but you're required to put them in a way that shines out into the world. So in your doorway or in your window. And that likely actually is pagan in origin, this idea of quite literally using the lights to light up the world in the darkest day. So, um, okay, another great question. The menorah has nine lights. What does the ninth one shamash stand for? Such a great question. So shamash literally means to ignite or to illumine. Um, and it is often seen or called the helper candle. And so the idea behind it is that we use this one candle to light the others. Um, for some of us, if we've ever had a birthday cake with lots of candles on it, and we know the challenge of with one match trying to go and light all of it before the match burns out, and so we have to light another match. So likely the origin of this was simply a function that in the times of the temple, they likely had something that there was being used to actually help light the menorah in the temple. And similar to this day, a ninth branch is, uh, is brought forward, and in making that actually a fixture of the Hanukkiah, it creates this nice image that plays out in these darkest days of the year that with one flame, we can create an infinite number of additional flames. With one light, we can spark infinite amounts of light in the world. And so it is with people as well. And so to this day, one of the positions, one of the functions actually in a Jewish synagogue is called a shamas or a shamash, is actually a person who is the helper person, who is helping to light the sparks of others, um, which is really beautiful. And so I think in many ways, that's also meant to be a reminder for us that we should all be shamashim. We should all be those lights that can spark the lights of others. So Rabbi, thank you. Thank you, as always. You have certainly shone a very bright light on all of this for us. And I can see from the chat and I'm, Everybody has really enjoyed this. And so um, I pray that we will see you next year in person. Um, and what is the saying next year in Jerusalem? Exactly. So next year at the Vedanta Center. <laughs> Maybe so. Thank you all so much. An honor to be with you. Honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Be safe.